Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. What is the outlook for class struggle in Britain in 2021? The pandemic was a world-shattering turning point. All the weaknesses of capitalism were laid bare in 2020, but in few countries more so than Britain. The nightmare which began in 2020 has not been limited to public health, but has infected the already ailing world economy, with British capitalism the worst hit of all the major capitalist powers. Working class and young people have already suffered hugely as the bosses try to pass on the pain. And the bare bones Brexit deal will only make things worse for Britain's capitalists. Boris Johnson's Tory government has been completely exposed for its incompetence and craven defence of profit over lives. But Keir Starmer's Labour offers no opposition whatsoever. Britain's working class has no political voice and desperately needs to build for a new, independent, mass workers' party. Already in 2021, the trade unions have overturned the government by forcing part closure of schools. And young people showed that they are ready to explode in protest in 2020's Black Lives Matter movement, with huge problems facing young people once again in 2021. British capitalism is not well. Meanwhile, Britain's working class is furious, but lacks political organisation and leadership. This episode of Socialism looks at Britain in 2021, a new era of capitalist crisis. So we're back for our first new podcast of 2021, and what a year it has been already in just a couple of weeks. Absolutely. And to take us through a little bit of a review of 2020, and particularly looking at the incredible developments which are already starting to show themselves in the year ahead, we have with us again Hannah Sell, the General Secretary of the Socialist Party. Hello, Hannah. Hi, James. Welcome back, and Happy New Year. To you too. And to our listeners as well. So... Our first question then is, what did 2020 mean for the working class in Britain? Okay, thanks James. Obviously, always, these questions have loads of answers and you can only (laughs) give a little bit of an answer in a short podcast. But 2020 was a real turning point and it did mark the start of a new era of intensified capitalist crisis. Mm. And I think we can all see that. And this discussion today is on Britain, but clearly that's the case globally. And I'm sure you'll be having a podcast on events in the US soon with what's been taking place there. (laughs) Obviously, 2020 and the start of 2021 are dominated by the COVID pandemic and everything that flows from that. And it was really a year of misery, wasn't it? Too many deaths, job losses, pay cuts, poverty. That was the experience, not just in Britain, but for working class people in pretty much every country on the planet in Mm. the course of 2020. The misery wasn't universal unsurprisingly. There were a few people who, even in the midst of a pandemic, saw and had an opportunity rather than misery. Mm -hmm. A section of the capitalist class are doing very nicely indeed. The 10 richest people in the world have increased their wealth by more than 300 billion since the (sighs) pandemic began. (laughs) Here in Britain last year, the CEOs of the hundreds biggest stock market listed companies collected 73 times the average wage of their workers Mm. in their wages. So, you know, that gives you a bit of an idea of the gulf between the few at the top and the majority. And specifically, there were the bosses really of logistics, PPE companies, pharmaceutical companies, a few others as well. Big tech. Yeah, absolutely. Their profits soared in the course of last year. But capitalism as a whole entered a really devastating crisis. And of course, it's the working class and the poor that are already paying for that crisis. So here in Britain, by the middle of last year, there were 5.6 million people claiming universal credit, with more than 60% of them having little or insufficient work or no work. You mm. know. And that's an increase of 3 million from October <laughs> of the year before. So it's more than doubled. More than doubled. 
the pandemic, it's estimated, and again, these are figures from the end of last year, and we all know it's getting worse as we speak, but had left two million families destitute. So that means struggling to feed, house, or clothe themselves. And, you know, we've all seen the pictures of the free school meal packages, literally, mm. like, two carrots, a potato and a bit of bread yeah. that have been sent out to families around the country. There are still more than two million people furloughed, often having to live on just 80% of their normal salary. So that's in addition to all the people on universal credit, but also fearing that soon they'll be added to the unemployment figures because they'll have no job to return to. Now, the Tory government in Britain, like every government that could afford to around the world, have spent massive sums of money bailing out their system and trying to prevent even worse damage to the capitalist economy in the course of last year. And they've done that. This is a devastating crisis, but it would have been even worse mm. without the amount of money that they've put in. But that now means that UK government debt is the highest it's ever been outside wartime. In fact, I think it's more than double what it's ever previously been outside of wartime. And it's already clear They've got no choice but to wear that debt at the moment and keep accumulating more debt, given mm. what's taking place. But they're going to try and use that debt as a reason to attack the living conditions of the working class further. And they already are, aren't they? They mm. announced a public sector pay freeze before Christmas at a time when in the last decade, to take civil servants as an example, and this is true across the public sector, in real terms, a civil servant's pay packet has shrunk by 19% in the course of the last decade. And now they get a new pay freeze on top of that and that's really a kind of down payment on the government's future intentions to squeeze the working class to pay for the huge debts that have been accumulated so it's a situation of misery obviously there's a continued real contraction in the economy at the moment because we're in another lockdown that's not to suggest that further down the road there won't be some economic recovery mm -hmm. Clearly, in the short term, the lockdown is making things worse, as I just said. But if the vaccines that are being rolled out prove to be effective, and we know they're taking risks on how they're doing that, yeah. but nonetheless, hopefully, they will prove effective. That, combined with the summer and so on, at a certain stage, there will be a lessening of the pandemic's grip and inevitably some economic rebound. But what is clear is that is not going to wipe out all the devastation. It's not going to bounce back to where we were before. The FT, the Financial Times, which is the capitalists talking to themselves, they had a survey at the end of last year, so before the new lockdown and the worsening of the situation, and the most optimistic of them thought it would take till the end of 2022 for UK <laughs> GDP to reach its pre-COVID level. So, you know, it's a bad situation. And we have to remember, this isn't just caused by a virus. This is a reflection of the capitalist system. And the nightmare of 2020 came not against the background of a healthy capitalist system, which was developing people's living standards, but against a very weak and crisis-ridden capitalist system, which was already heading into a new slowdown, mm. and in which British capitalism was going to be among the worst from that, even without the pandemic. Mm. So back in 2019, the IMF said that the level of UK corporate debt was such that almost 40% of it would become impossible to service in the event of a recession that was half as deep as 2007, 2008. And of this, course... This what... is a major, rich, first world capitalist yeah, economy. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's not alone, by the way. There were others in a similar situation. But, of course, we've got a far deeper recession than 2007, 2008. Mm. And the only thing that has prevented that corporate debt becoming unserviceable and massive swathes of companies closing... Of course, there are many that are going bankrupt, but it being on an even bigger scale is the huge state intervention, which, for, at least for now, is preventing that taking place on the scale it otherwise would have done. So the economic situation is very bad. And then I've not spent much time on the health situation, but of course, the pandemic is being completely mishandled by this government. We've had lots of podcasts on it. I don't yeah. think I need to repeat all the points about their repeated catastrophic failures and how they're costing the lives and creating terrible hardship for millions of people. But let's face it, where we are now, having messed up everything, everything they've done, done too late, too little, 
handed out cash to their mates in blatant cronyism who've then failed to run track and trace systems, all the rest of it. They're now being forced into a situation of lockdown because the NHS is close to being overwhelmed. And Mm. that's really the driving force to the measures that are taking place now. The only points I'd add here on this, as terrible as this government is, it would be too simplistic to say that the reason that Britain is doing particularly badly in the pandemic is because of the government's incompetence. I mean, it is incompetent, obviously. But there are other factors as well. And probably... In the end, an even greater factor are the huge cuts that have taken place in the public sector over the course of the last decade. Let's be clear, the underfunding of the NHS means that every winter, when there's no pandemic, it reaches crisis point. Mm. It's not a surprise that when you have an out-of-control pandemic as a result of the government's mishandling of the situation, the NHS can't cope, Mm because it's on its knees anyway. The death rates are bad because of the mishandling of the pandemic, but they're also bad because of the levels of poverty in Britain. Deaths from respiratory illnesses are three times as high in Britain as the European average. And where are the death rates highest? This is outside of a pandemic. This is in normal times. Mm. They're highest in South Wales, Glasgow and Liverpool, some Mm. of the poorest parts of Britain. Which used to have industry, which now don't. Exactly, yeah. So the... Misery that we're facing from the pandemic is also related to the sickness of British capitalism as a system and the enormous inequality that exists, the undermining of our public services. And, you know, there's lots of other things to say, but that gives you a bit of a picture of the state of Britain at the start of 2021. So I think a lot of people, (laughs) not just listening to this podcast, but working people in Britain, all of this situation is plain to them and they'll be asking, given all of this... How on earth is Boris Johnson still in power? I know. (laughs) Yeah, good question. I mean, look, there was never wholehearted trust in Johnson. I know he won an election not very long ago at all, in reality, at the end of 2019. Yeah. Yeah. But there wasn't wholehearted trust in him, even at the start. But there's no question, at the beginning of the pandemic, the dominant mood in society was we've got to give the bloke a chance to sort this out. Give him a breathing space. And... Johnson tried to create this national unity narrative. We're all in it together, back me for the common good. And unfortunately, the trade union leaders largely fell in behind that. Starmer is still falling in behind that. And so that mood existed. But now it's long gone. The reason that Johnson is still there is not because people think he's doing a good job. They really, really don't. On the contrary, big sections of the working class hate Johnson at this point in time. And Mm. he is widely seen as having messed this up completely, having acted for the rich and not the majority and so on. But that's not reflected in the opinion polls. I mean, he's gone down a lot in the polls. But most polls show Labour neck and neck with the Tories. At best. At best, yeah. (laughs) Or the Tories slightly ahead. Or there's one or two that show Labour they were marginally ahead but you know it's not a good situation and there's one reason for that it's because Starmer has consistently acted as a prop for the government he's backed them up at every stage his criticisms have been extremely mild limited and belated normally half an hour before the u-turn Starmer finally manages <laughs> to oppose what they've been doing when everyone can see it's coming anyway exactly yeah and of course I'm not going to spend loads of time on specific events but I think we do have to talk about the run-up to the current lockdown because it was shown so clearly there you had a situation before Christmas where the government was threatening to take councils to court because they wanted to close the schools a few days early because the pandemic was reaching such levels in their schools of the virus. And then you had the government saying the schools are all opening again. Everything's marvellous. They're completely safe. Blah, blah, blah. And you had the intervention of trade unionists. They were the driving force. The Socialist Party played a role in it, but it was rank and file, NEU and Unison members in particular, who put pressure on their leaders and their leaders then did act, especially the leadership of the NEU. And you had an effective campaign that was run to say it is not safe to go back into school. We are not safe. So I think there were 6,000 primary schools received Section 44 notices, which were notices saying it is not safe for us to work in this environment. Therefore, we're not going in. Therefore, we're not going in. So they were saying the schools are not safe given the levels of the virus. And they forced a change in the situation. So on the Monday morning, 
The Department of Education civil servants were briefed. The schools that were open, we know there were some shut, the secondary schools by that stage and some primaries, but the rest of the primaries are staying open. It's safe. And by eight o'clock that night, all of the schools were <laughs> shut. And it was the trade union movement, the workers' movement, that were key in changing that situation. But what was Starmer's position? Even as that U-turn was developing, he was still saying, we need a new lockdown, but I am not prepared to call for the schools to be closed because it will only add to the chaos. Mm. This was while there were some Tory councils shutting the schools. Yes, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Hunt was calling for the schools to be shut. That's right, yeah, you seeing know. the Tory MP. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And still... Starmer was so frightened of being seen to give any support to the workers' movement and the trade unions that he wasn't prepared to call for the schools to shut. And that was really an object lesson for teachers especially and school staff, of course, that Starmer doesn't represent their interests. Mm. And it's been holding up this weak government through the course of the whole of the last year. And of course, I'll come back to this, but that does pose that a big issue for the workers' movement in Britain in 2021 is the question that we need our own political voice that Starmer it does not represent the working class and we need a political voice that does but it's also a bit of a demonstration of the power of the trade union movement and the working class mm. and it's not the only example I think it is also just worth mentioning here the Royal Mail deal because through the course of last year Postal workers balloted and were stopped by the courts, but again and again showed their determination to struggle with huge victories for action, overwhelming majorities. Now, unfortunately, particularly under that national unity pressure at the start of the first part of last year, the leadership of the union didn't take full advantage of that mood. But nonetheless, from what I've seen, the deal that has been won at least pushes back Royal Mail management. It's not everything that could have been won or mm. everything that we need, but it is a bit of an indication of the power of Royal Mail workers. And actually, there's a point here because the pandemic creates a very difficult situation for the workers' movement, but some sections of workers have got more power than they've ever had before. Mm. And that includes workers who deliver things. <laughs> they really do. And that has partly been reflected in the way management have been pushed back in that deal. Now, having said that, obviously, in the lockdown situation we're in right now, while there's huge anger, it's not an easy time for workers to find an organised means to express that anger. It's quite a difficult situation. But I don't think we should conclude that that means that even during the lockdown, there won't be expressions of working class anger and struggle, because there can be. There's continuing issues on health and safety, including in the schools. That's not over. <laughs> because, but yeah, many schools are operating actually at almost full capacity, yeah. and particularly teaching assistants, but school staff in general are in a very difficult situation. So that struggle is ongoing. There's also the question of the public sector pay freeze. And obviously, in this situation where there's mass unemployment developing the pressure comes on workers you're lucky to have a job don't fight for increased pay mm. but on the other side when public sector workers are amongst those who are in the front line in this pandemic risking their lives that can lead to a correct mood of we deserve decent pay for this mm. and there can be a mood to struggle on that question of the public sector pay freeze and then i think it's also just worth mentioning students because actually this week, while they're stuck at home, they're not even <laughs> on the campuses, yeah. students have won a partial victory because they've got some rebate back for their empty halls of residence that they're not even in. Now, it's not enough. They've got to fight for a complete rebate mm. and for students who are in private rented accommodation to get their money back. But also, it's not just about rent, is it? It's about the fact they've paid £9,000 in fees <laughs> for... Not very much this yeah, year, and yeah. they should get a complete rebate on their fees. Yeah. But the fact they've been able to win some concessions, even while they're stuck at home, is a bit of an indication that further struggles can develop on those issues, even during the lockdown period. And then the other thing I just want to mention on things that can develop during lockdown that we have to be prepared for is it's clear that there's a propaganda ratcheting up again of blaming individuals' behaviour for the situation rather than for the failure of government policy mm. and, of course, the fact that big businesses are still wanting to make profits and are making their workers work in situations that are not safe. But it, there's no doubt they're, they're stepping it up again. You went for a walk with two of your friends. That means that you've, you're causing a spread of the virus. All of Jeez, that yeah. kind of stuff. Now, 
the not do- the supermarkets, not the schools. Exactly, yeah. And of course, the dominant mood in society is a justified fear of the virus. Of course. And a desire to obey all of the rules. And that's what people are doing as far as they possibly can, overwhelmingly. But at the same time, unlike when they tried this last time, people recognise the main blame lies with the government. They can see all the mistakes that have been made. So there's not the same mood of let's go along with this as there was previously. And there are different sections of society, particularly a layer of young people who, you know, feel like they've got no future for good reason and are really suffering. But also some of the most impoverished sections who can't afford to eat at the moment are stuck at home. You can get explosions of anger, particularly against police repression that's excessive. Mm. So I think we have There's to be... Pro- been a bit of yeah, that, there, has, there has been a bit of that, but it can develop more. So I think mm. we've just got to be aware of that developing as well in the next period. But I think overall, there's no question that it's not just the societies in lockdown. Struggles a bit in lockdown as well, because it's just hard to organise. You know, to demonstrate at the moment on a big scale is not an easy thing to do, given people's worries about health and so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean that people aren't getting angry. On the contrary, if you think back to last summer, the Black Lives Matter movement, which was a fantastic movement... Part of the reason it exploded on the scale it did was because it came after. It was still formally during a lockdown, but it came at the end of a whole period of lockdown. And we will see an accumulation of anger Mm. and struggle on a very big scale, potentially, in the later phases or after the lockdown has ended. And the other thing I would just say on it is just because people can't find a means to express their anger on a mass scale doesn't mean they're not thinking, we need to change the world. This Mm. doesn't work. We want something different. And that there's a big increase in the number of people looking to socialist solutions in this period of time. And, of course, you can join the Socialist Party. Mm. You may have to take part on Socialist Party meetings on Zoom rather than in real life at the moment, but you can still come to Socialist Party meetings. And we need to take all the opportunities we can to build the Socialist Party during this kind of lockdown period. But at a certain stage, as the virus recedes, things are going to change dramatically, and really we're preparing for that. If Johnson is still Prime Minister, and that's not guaranteed, they could get rid of him before then if he becomes a complete liability for the government. But if he's still Prime Minister, and for the government, whoever is the Prime Minister, their problems are really just going to be beginning then. Mm. Because people's accumulated anger at the Covid crisis will probably be mainly expressed once it's receded. Now we're going to sort you out for the mess that you made of all of this. And of course, that will also come with the continued economic disaster, the misery, mass unemployment, even though there'll be some recovery for people's lives, it will become clear this wasn't just a temporary thing that's fixed. It's continuing and therefore a mood to fight on that. And just to add, I know this is going on to the next question. But the Brexit deal that's just been negotiated is not going to help that economic situation. Mm. It's going to hinder it. So there's a sense, really, of the working class and the youth in particular in Britain being like something of a coiled spring at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. And really, it's only the absence of an alternative leadership, and we'll talk about this more later on, which is keeping Johnson in power. Yeah. But... This economic catastrophe, which is already unplaying, which Brexit, in fact, is an expression of, but is going to exacerbate Mm. as well. The Socialist Party campaigned for a vote to leave the EU, which we see as a bosses club, as a capitalist club in the 2016 referendum. But of course, we don't support Johnson's anti-working class deal. Can you explain this complicated situation a little bit and how you think this Brexit deal will affect British capitalism. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it is important, as you put in the question, to just go over our position on this issue. I'm sure there are previous podcasts where you can get it in more depth. Mm. But it is important because we campaigned, as you said, for a vote for leave. And we did that because we don't support the pro-big business neoliberal rules of the EU Bosses Club. Mm. The EU is an attempt to have the biggest possible market to make profits for capitalism and has always been based on all kinds of anti-working class pro-privatisation measures. And if you look back to events in the last decade, the way that misery was inflicted on the people of Greece, for example, is a real concrete example of what uh, the institutions 
institutions of the EU do. They act in the interests of the elite and they're prepared to drive the majority into the dirt. Mm. So we were opposed to the EU and we campaigned for leave. And we also think that the root cause of the size of the working class vote for Brexit was the anger of millions of working class people at everything that they'd suffered, the austerity and misery that had taken place in Britain. And it was seen as a means to protest against that. Had Jeremy Corbyn stuck by his original position, Mm. because he was leader of the Labour Party quite newly at that point in time, prior to being leader of the Labour Party, he had consistently argued that the EU was a neoliberal bosses club Mm -hmm. and had voted against all the neoliberal treaties that were implemented by the EU and passed by the British Parliament and would have explained very clearly how EU laws, for example, could have not prevented but hampered the ability of a left government to carry out nationalisation and other things that were later in his manifesto. But one of the first concessions he made to the right of the Labour Party as leader was to agree to campaign for Remain Mm. in that referendum. And we know he didn't do it very enthusiastically, but he did it. Mm -hmm. And that left a vacuum in which the right-wing nationalist Little Englander anti-EU forces who were opposing the EU from a completely different point of view, Mm. but they were allowed to dominate completely. There was no mass left voice arguing against the EU. Now, that's all ancient history, I know. So it's like, (laughs) why are you going on about that? But the reason it's necessary to just raise it is because the way things turned out was not preordained. It could have happened differently. Had Corbyn taken the stance that we took as a much smaller force and that he had taken historically on the question of the EU, Mm. it would have altered how history developed. First of all, it would have made it much easier for him to win a general election because he would have shown to working class people right back in 2015 that he was prepared to stand up against the establishment and fight in their interests. And he could have put a socialist, internationalist, anti-racist anti-EU position rather than what actually did dominate. But also, let's be clear, had Corbyn won a general election and implemented socialist policies and then taken part in a negotiation with the rest of the EU on Brexit, on that basis, he would have been in an infinitely stronger position than any capitalist Tory government. Because what we say he should have done is to appeal to the working class across Europe. Appeal to the Greek working class, the French working class, the Irish working class, who have all opposed the neoliberal treaties of the EU, to say, we stand in solidarity with you, we're not against you, but we want to renegotiate because the EU, as it stands, is a neoliberal treaty. And if he'd taken that approach, he would have terrified the capitalist yeah. class, actually. <laughs> and it would have been an entirely different situation. So I'm running over those points, because, of course, all that seems very distant from where we are today. Yeah. And obviously did not happen at all. But it wasn't preordained the way things turned out. But then, of course, instead, we've got this weak, divided, very right-wing Tory government negotiating a Brexit deal. And look... All Tory governments, whether they're pro or anti-EU, are in complete opposition to the interests of the working class. Of course. You know, and we don't support the deals they negotiate of whatever type. Right. Johnson has been negotiating from what he perceives to be the interests of British capitalism. However... (laughs) (laughs) Do the capitalists agree with him? (laughs) No, not so much. There's only a tiny minority of the British capitalist class who could possibly be pleased with that Brexit deal. Right. It went through Parliament overwhelmingly because they feared that they could end up with no deal. And so I think the capitalist class were all relieved that there was some deal Mm. and therefore were in favour of politicians voting in favour of it. And it's true that he managed to negotiate a continuation of the status quo in relation to goods being traded without tariffs between Britain and the EU. But there's caveats even to that, because that's the case now. But at any time, if the EU judges that Britain has diverted too far from their rules, they can start imposing tariffs. Mm. But of course, as we've already seen... There are all kinds of checks that are still being implemented, which are new obstacles to trade moving, to goods moving between the EU and Britain. But at the same time, it can get much worse. Really, what they've done is they've set up a framework 
for future negotiations. They've kind of pushed the can down the road. Again, they've been doing that for half a decade already. Yeah, and it's a continuation. And of course, in all of those negotiations, Britain will be the weaker negotiator because it's the smaller power. But that's on trade. At the same time, 80% of the British economy is finance and services, and they haven't even started the negotiations on that yet. (laughs) But already, in the first week, six billion of daily trading is estimated to have left the city of London and gone to European financial centres. Mm. Now, look, we shouldn't exaggerate. British finance capital is quite a powerful thing. And the city of London is not just going to disappear as a world player, but it is nonetheless an indication that being outside of the EU will tend to diminish its power as compared to other worlds. So from the point of view of British capitalism, this is not a good deal. It's not helping them. It's putting them in a weaker position. And of course... Effectively, there is now a border in the Irish Sea. Right. For all he said he wasn't going to do it, that's the outcome of this. And it's not just a question of the difficulties that's creating with goods being traded at the moment, although that's real. Mm. That will exacerbate sectarian tensions and conflict in the north of Ireland. Right. There's no question as well that the national question will be fuelled. It's already developing a pace in Scotland, the demand for independence in Scotland as a result of the Brexit deal. So all of this is creating big problems for British capitalism. Why has Johnson done it? You know, what he says he represents the interests of the capitalist class. He's attempting to. Mm. What does he think he's going to get out of this deal? Despite their denials, their economic strategy actually is to turn Britain into Singapore on Thames. What does that mean? <laughs> All their propaganda about, you know, basically Britain will go back to being a major imperialist power. This is the the opposite of that. Singapore on Thames means going further down the road to a low corporation tax, low regulation economy. The development, for example, of free ports on a bigger scale, which are basically super exploitation tax free zones. That's what they mean. They've got a government paper, a scheme to follow Singapore in becoming a flag of convenience for international shipping. That's where powers say your ships can go under our flag and you don't have to have any rights for your workers whatsoever. You can do whatever the hell you like. This is the road that they want to take (laughs) British capitalism down. And then no doubt they do also think they can have increased state aid to try and develop some high-tech sectors of the economy. And as they attempt to do that, they'll make big news of how they're doing that. Mm. But I think we should just look at the last year where they have followed a strategy of giving state aid to their mates. And look how that's worked out. It's been a disaster in the COVID pandemic. I mean, they may develop, manage to develop in one or two small areas. But the idea that British capitalism is going to be able to compete with the major blocks of the EU, but also the US, China, Japan, on the basis of this strategy, frankly, it's ruled out. So, look, let's be clear. The economic woes facing British capitalism are not caused by Brexit. They're not caused by COVID even. They're caused by the underlying weakness of British capitalism. But nonetheless, this Brexit deal will hinder, not help. And the COVID pandemic is an enormous accelerator of all of the crises of British capitalism. So that's a situation facing the rich and the ruling class in this country. As we know, they will attempt to pass that misery overwhelmingly onto ordinary people. And it's our role to attempt to stop them and use that weakness (laughs) against them rather than accepting that this misery will be heaped on us. So what are the prospects for struggle? Okay, so I think you can't give exact timescales and we have to be aware that how quickly people feel confident, especially to strike industrially, is difficult to work out at this scale. I mean, it will take place, but when it takes place on a mass scale, it can depend on how deep the economic crisis is. It can take actually a little bit longer if people are worried that they're immediately going to lose their job on a huge scale, Mm. and therefore it can take a bit longer for a mass strike wave to develop. On the other hand... Everything they've suffered in the last year can make people think, sod it, we've got to strike and move quite quickly. So I think it's very hard to be certain on the question of how quickly industrial struggles will develop on a big scale. But what is certain is we will see social explosions, mass movements and radicalisation developing quite quickly and a politicisation and that mainly that is going to create opportunities for the workers' movement and for socialists, for ourselves, to develop support for our ideas. But we also have to say, given the weakness at the top of the workers' movement, 
it will also unfortunately leave space for new right populist and even far right formations to grow mm. new forms of Farageism the equivalent of Trumpism in the US so it's not automatic that the left gains from this situation the right will also have opportunities as well and of course what we do can make a difference in cutting away the space for them to grow by offering a serious left fighting alternative but as I said look there's no question there's going to be explosive struggles and actually if you look at the list of issues people might want to fight about or feel they have to fight about youth unemployment housing mass evictions taking place the cutting of universal credit mm. factory occupations if factories are threatened with closure the student movements that are already starting to rumble would you want to bet what's going to happen first because i don't <laughs> and actually a few could develop simultaneously mm. so i would just emphasize a point i touched on earlier which is that There'll be big opportunities to build support for socialist ideas and big opportunities for us to play a role in making sure a whole host of different struggles are successful. But actually, the Socialist Party specifically and the socialist movement as a whole could face being overwhelmed by the scale of struggle. And the best way to prevent that is to build the socialist movement now. Mm. And if you agree, if you're sitting at home listening and thinking, I agree with what the Socialist Party are saying, don't just sit at home, join us now, because we're going to need as many people as possible for the scale of struggle that is coming down the track. But then the other kind of final important point I think we have to spend a bit of time on is that the one big advantage that the capitalist class have at the moment is what I touched on at the beginning, that there is no mass political voice for working class people. And in fact, in Starmer's New Labour, they have a party which is reliable to act in the capitalist interests. Mm. And that's what he's been showing all year, isn't it? Yeah. He will do what's right for the capitalist class rather than what is right for the majority. And this question of fighting for a mass workers' party, for the trade union and the workers' movement in Britain to have its own political voice, that is a very important part of what we have to do in the Socialist Party in the course of the next year. Because the working class is facing an economic and social catastrophe and it will fight in different forms. But how confident it is to fight Fight. having a political arm to that battle mm. is part of that it plays an important part in it it can change how quickly people are confident to fight industrially for example so look no question we will see struggles against workplaces closing including the possibility of occupations taking place but if there was a mass party that was saying not just we support your struggle but we call that your workplace should be nationalized under democratic working class control. And we should not allow massive job losses. We should nationalise industry rather than doing that. And we will fight for that and implement it if elected. That would have a big impact on giving workers confidence to fight. Sure. Just like the public sector pay freeze. If there was a powerful party in Parliament saying, look, how dare they suggest that the reason is for mass unemployment is because you want a fair pay rise. That's a disgrace. Mm. The CEOs are making massive amounts of money. Of course you should get a fair pay rise. And beyond that, we're going to massively expand the amount of money that's spent on the public sector and so on. It would give people more confidence to struggle. Right. So there's a direct relation between building a political voice and giving people more confidence to fight back. Where are we going to get such a political voice from? There are obviously still those who hope to transform Labour into a workers' party. And there was obviously a possibility of that when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader. Not that it was a workers' party, mm. but a battle to kick out the pro-capitalist elements and to develop it into a party that did have socialist policies and stood up for the working class was clearly there. But having failed to achieve that when it had a left leader, <laughs> in our view, the idea that's going to be achieved now when the structures of Labour were not transformed under Corbyn's leadership, and mm. it's been quite easy, actually, for Starmer to step in and grab control, we think it's utopian. We think it's time to set up something new at this point in time. Now, obviously, just before Christmas, Jeremy Corbyn himself announced this new project for peace and justice. Mm -hmm. And I saw on social media quite a lot of people saying, oh, good, a new party, and well done, Jeremy, <laughs> you're setting up a new party, and so on. But its limited written material so far indicates that that is not how Jeremy and the organisers see it. They mm -hmm. don't see it as a step towards a new party. 
just a quote from the Canary, which was a kind of favourable left article supporting the project. They described it as saying it aims to work beyond political party lines and to foster cooperation and change outside of democratic processes. So not a political project at all? Not a political project at all. And if you read its website, it starts on the question of research. It seems to see itself more as a left think tank, honestly, Mm. than anything else. The Canary themselves, while they're very positive about it, say there may be some disappointment that Corbyn hasn't launched a new political party in the face of the continuing demise of the Labour Party. And Mm. we would say, yes, that is accurate. (laughs) If it develops on these lines, it's not going to help workers who in the elections taking place this year we have the most local elections taking place i think ever in history this year they may be delayed a bit from may because of the previous ones being delayed it's this bumper local election year Mm. for workers who are facing a choice between voting for starmer's labor party and the tories (sighs) how does it help to have a political think tank coming (laughs) you know it it just (laughs) Frankly, it will be judged to be avoiding the issue, the elephant in the room. How does it help any EU members who are fighting for safety in their schools and have had Starmer do absolutely nothing to back them up and will want to express their view at the ballot box? They Mm. need a political voice that actually does that. We've raised, and it's only one example, but I think it's quite a good one to show how much more effective it would be if the left who are currently looking to Labour actually started to fight themselves at the ballot box, is the question of the London mayor. Mm. Because the London mayor's coming up for election this year. Sadiq Khan has played a terrible role throughout his time in office, is right now threatening big attacks on workers on the London Underground and London Transport in particular. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn could stand for London mayor. Mm -hmm. The Transport Workers' Union, the RMT, are raising the idea of an anti-cuts candidate. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn will be a very good anti-cuts candidate for London Mayor. And let's be clear, Ken Livingstone won London Mayor from outside of the Labour Party. Yeah. Unfortunately, he only used that to get back into the Labour Party (laughs) and then attack London Transport Workers. But leaving that aside, given Corbyn's profile... He could win if he was to stand for London mayor and it would act to enthuse all of those who can see no political voice at the moment, provided he stood on a left platform and stood with a list standing for the London Assembly of trade unionists, socialists and so on. Even more important than what could be achieved by Corbyn as an individual, you know, he is only one individual, is what the left trade union leaders should be doing. Mm. They are rightly protesting against Corbyn's suspension from the Labour Party and calling for him to be reinstated. But at this stage, their battle is all on the legal front and through the Labour Party. And we don't think that's enough. It's necessary to do more than that. If the left trade unions, for example, were to call a mass conference, even a Zoom conference at this point in time, where you can't have one in real life, Mm. of all trade unionists and parts of the workers' movement that want a socialist voice, that oppose Corbyn's suspension... If they were to call a conference like that and say, we do not accept the political direction of Starmer, we do not accept the suspension, not just of Corbyn, but of the thousands of other left in the Labour Party who've been kicked out for supporting Corbyn, and we're not going to go any further down this road. We would want such a conference to establish a new party, and mm. that's what we'd go and argue for. But let's be clear, even if it didn't go that far, even if they just said, either Labour lets Corbyn back in, stands on a left platform, and selects candidates who are actually going to stand up for our members to represent us in May's local elections. And if you don't do that, we are going to allow our local branches to support other candidates, to stand themselves Mm. in May's local elections. Even just doing that would send shockwaves through British politics. And by the way, of course, we will be going along to local union branches arguing for that. So... It's urgent that they take action and it is frustrating at the moment because the working class is facing this dire situation and you feel that unfortunately even the left trade union leaders are not doing what is necessary to help give working class people a political voice. Of course in the Socialist Party we never just say this is terrible, there's nothing can be done about it. Indeed. We always try and act as a lever to get something to happen. And we're doing that in this May's elections. So historically, we've been part of something called the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition, which is a coalition, like it says on the tin, of (laughs) trade unionists and socialists. It's got the support of the Transport Workers Union, the RMT, Mm. 
the Socialist Party, Chris Williamson's group, who is an expelled Labour MP, expelled in the Corbyn era for opposing the move to the right and the witch hunt and so on. And it's got other socialists supporting it. And we're going to stand as broadly as we can in this May's elections. And we would say to any group of strikers, teachers, worker activists who want to oppose the cuts, Tusk is there available for you as a means to do that. It's an umbrella. It's a federation. We want you all to join the Socialist Party. But you don't have to agree with everything the Socialist Party says to stand as part of Tusk. Mm. All you have to agree on is working class people need a political voice and we need people in the council chambers who are prepared not just to cry about cuts while they implement them, but to actually stand up and fight the cuts. If you agree with that, then you should stand under the Tusk banner. And potentially, if other forces don't move before next May's elections, Mm. Tusk could actually stand on quite a significant scale and perhaps show in practice to some of the left trade union leaders who are not acting... This is possible. This is what can be done. We can build a new mass party that fights for a left programme. Of course, electoral politics are only part of the tasks that we face. Mm. And without going on too much longer, I would just finish by saying the other thing about this pandemic is it's shown graphically that capitalism doesn't work. It's shown graphically that even the most right-wing capitalist politicians, the only way they can prop their system up in a crisis is by huge state intervention, Mm. gigantic state intervention. And that poses the question, why don't we have a different kind of society? Mm -hmm. Why don't we have a socialist society where you take these major corporations and banks into democratic public ownership and you harness their resources to begin to build a society that actually acts in the interests of the majority. That's what the Socialist Party is fighting for. And those ideas are gaining ground because they're so objectively inherent in the situation. Mm -hmm. And you read the serious capitalist press, they're terrified of that. They were so relieved that they got through the 2007-2008 economic crisis. There was a growth in support for socialist ideas but without a successful socialist transformation of society in any country. But they're not convinced they'll get away with that this time Mm. because the crisis of capitalism is so deep and the need for socialism is so clear. So there are going to be big opportunities to build support for socialist ideas and to say again, if you agree with all of that, then you know you should definitely join the Socialist Party. Right, well, as we always close, if you like what you've heard, donate to help fund us recommend us and this episode in particular to your co-workers and to your friends and as hannah has rightly emphasized repeatedly if you agree join the socialist party thanks very much hannah okay no problem socialism is produced by the socialist party the england and wales section of the committee for a workers international today we heard from hannah sell and i'm james ivins this episode was edited by nick hart You can find further reading in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? Now is the time. Apply to join at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to the capitalists. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.